Well, it's a meatball. It's a meatball if it goes to that meatball sub or a kebab. Oh, that, I like that. That doesn't make I'm sense. I'm not saying kebab, that's like legit or correct. That's just what I was taught. <laughs> That and it resonated. <laughs> so <laughs> resonated. I like it. Okay. With on that note, I'm gonna go into the intro. So just before we get any further, um, it's really important to point out our code of conduct. So Women Who Code is an inclusive community dedicated to providing an empowering experience for everyone who participates in or supports our community, regardless of their gender, gender identity, expression sexual orientation, ability, physical appearance, body size, race, ethnicity, age, religion, socioeconomic status, caste, creed, political affiliation, or preferred programming languages. Um, our events are intended to inspire women to excel in technology careers, and anyone who's there for this purpose is welcome 100%. We do not tolerate harassment of any members in any form, and our code of conduct applies to all women who code events and online communities. So thank you for sending that in the chat, Amanda, if anyone um, has any negative experience um, that would be reported to Women Who Code, um, please do use that form, onewhocode.com slash code of conduct, and we'll address um, any issues. We are sorry in advance if you feel uncomfortable at any point. Um, we do really try to make everyone feel comfortable. So um, please do follow like Zoom etiquette uh, in general. Um, and then if anything goes beyond um, your comfort level, please do report in the code of conduct. So overall, Women Who Code's mission is to inspire women to excel in technology careers. And our vision is a world where women are representative as technical executives, founders, venture capitalists, board members, and software engineers. We have a global reach, so um, we can visualize this right now since um, we're, I'm getting this speech right now from Portland, Oregon, somewhere around here. Um, and our speaker is from where exactly, what city are you in? St. Louis. St. Louis, so somewhere around here. Um, and we, I've attended events like across the globe. So it's really cool that we have this international 501c3 profit um, to benefit from you know, members around the world. And oh, there's always people willing to connect with you and help you out if you're struggling or um, just have any questions for someone in the field. There's some, someone out there in the whole wide world too help you out. Our movement um, is specifically focused around um, as the world changes, connecting everyone, being a connecting force to create a sense of belonging while the world is being asked to isolate. So that's why we are very thankful for our Zoom conferences. Um, we're able to continue our design study nights and other events without um, you know, risking any um, unwellness. I also realize I'm I paused my share, so <laughs> I had slides up this whole time. Were we not seeing these? <laughs> no, and I was going to say something, but I didn't want to interrupt. <laughs> Thank you for um, listening to my spiel anyway. Um, <laughs> probably the most interesting one is this one. I just looked at your one, pretty but... face. I was oh, like, she's you. just so pretty. <laughs> <laughs> oh, now I'm going to be self-conscious. Just kidding. Um, Thank you for your patience, everyone. I'm sorry, it's, I've been telling everyone that I moved, so my brain's a little crazy. So just accept the crazy, it's gonna be a great night. Um, we are around the world as Women Who Code. Um, we wanna create a sense of belonging, um, especially as we're forced to isolate, but hopefully we'll be opening up soon. Um, and after the call, you can connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and meet up at Women Who Code or www.codeportland.com or .com. Um, we are at Women Who Code Portland.slack.com, I think is what I was jumping to. Um, and then we have our email address, Portland at Women Who Code.com for our specific chapter, but we are um, a global organization, so you can find us everywhere. And then I think now's a good time for me to stop talking for a second. Um, take drink some water and pass it off to Amanda from 52 Limited to give a little bit of information on um, if we were in person, you would be hosting our events, but um, you are here to still support us through, through our virtual events. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, I am Amanda Bullent. I work with 52 Limited. I am their senior technology recruiter. And yeah, in, uh, well, hopefully soon, we'll be able to host these events in person in our office space. 
Um, and what we do is creative and technical staffing. We're always looking for, you know, senior development resources, project management, um, all the way up to like CTO and executive level searches. Um, if you're interested in looking into our job postings, uh, I'll just pop in the chat our website. Um, we also have a really cool event coming up on the 16th of June. Um, it's called 10 Minutes with 52. And in this edition, we will be having somebody speak about how to pivot into project management and you know what sort of things you know somebody looking to be in project management should start doing to kind of move that direction. Um, so I'll also send that in the chat in case anybody is interested. It is a free event. They generally run about 10 minutes. Um, so yeah, quick and fun. Um, yeah, that's a little bit about us. I hope y'all have a great night and I'm here to help with all the things. Yes, and you are very much appreciated. Um, if you anyone, this is a good point to bring up that um, if anyone has any questions throughout the talk, um, you can put them in the chat. I don't know what Holly's preference is if you would want to address the questions as they come in or I can like try the, to tie them in as you're talking or we can just save them for the end. I'm all about collaboration. So I'm happy to answer questions as I go. Although I suck at looking at the chat and presenting <laughs> at the same time. So, so that's what Amanda is just, for. I will intentionally pause to see if there's questions for okay. sure. And feel, and if I, there, there's, one pops up, feel free to interrupt me. That's also fine. All right. I mean, Perfect. easy breezy like that, like yeah. a Sunday morning. Let's do that. And then I think this is actually the point where I can introduce you, Holly. Um, let me pull up my speaker notes. I'm on a single screen right now, so I think I might even be blocking the presentation, but um, let me go ahead and read your spiel. So um, Holly Schroeder is an insights and empathy research consultant for a global fintech enterprise, UX research and design instructor, and a writer. She is the current co-president of the St. Louis Experience Design Meetup and an executive board member of Ally STL. Um, as a person with disabilities, Holly is passionate about accessibility and inclusive product development. Mentorship and community building are core principles that drive her. She's a confessed club starting and joining junkie. Always curious, she enjoys exploring nature through her camera lens, watercolor painting, DIY woodworking attempts, and learning new skills. Most recently, she started taking improv classes. Holly lives with her six foot eight inches husband and her their menagerie of pets. Um, she's 100% extroverted and is surviving the pandemic by wearing a mask, limiting social visits, and virtually glo globe trotting through meetups and conferences. And this is one of those. So we are very happy to have you speaking to us today, Holly. Um, I can go in ahead and stop sharing if you want to steal the spotlight, um, if you're ready. Oh, sure. And thanks for the intro. Yeah. I was like, I couldn't remember if I was supposed to make one or not. Um, so <laughs> I won't linger on mine. <laughs> uh, so, um, okay, so I have done this before. <laughs> I, I somehow I sometimes it. Okay, it's I have a tab problem is the problem. Mm. So if I did not, and I closed some actually. Um, so you would think it would be a little easier to navigate. Let me, okay, is this, I don't I know. I see why rainbow bookshelf. Had, okay, progress, we're almost there. All right. The only thing is, I don't want you guys to go away. I don't want to look at me. There you are. Okay. Hello. That's boring. Oh, it's loading so very slow. Hopefully, well, worst case scenario, you've got the link. Okay. Nope. Yes. There it went. 
Okay. So tonight we're going to talk all about how to craft a story with research results. And this probably sounds maybe not exciting. Um, and that's okay. I can understand why that would make, or maybe challenging to make that in, interesting. If you're somebody who does research, like how the heck am I gonna craft a story from research results from a bunch of numbers and messy notes and transcripts. And so we're gonna talk about all those things. Um, but first I have a couple things. So I think Kaylin covered pretty much most of this uh, other than my most famous quote, I put it somewhere really good, which is, I say that five times a day at least while I'm, I spend a lot of time looking for things um, that I put somewhere really good. And uh, yeah. Oh, and so I'm, I'm a writer also, and I have a surprise. So my editor told me today that I could give away five copies of this book. I contributed a chapter on accessibility to the book and the I'm chapter 21. I specifically asked for an odd number chapter because that's the kind of gal I am. Um, it just felt right. I think my picture's under the purple post-it note. That's why you can't see me. But so I have five copies to give away They'll come directly from the publisher. And Kaylin, did you decide how you wanted to make that happen? Yeah. So Amanda's got a link to a Google form. So if you're interested in receiving one of these five copies, you can enter the giveaway by entering your name and your email address in that form. Um, and then we will reach out at some point. Do we want to do it now or toward the end of the event? Oh, I don't we need like we need like, um, you know, we've got to build some tension. Okay, I like it. <laughs> yeah, so. Storytelling is well, part of UX, right? Gotta like build. Right, like we, we haven't even started our story arc. I just threw out <laughs> a teaser. Um, okay. And so we can use, my favorite when I was teaching was the wheel of names, but we can use whatever method. if people were not participating, I would put all their names on a wheel and spin it. Turns out you only have to do that a couple times and then you just get your mouse near it and then people volunteer. It was amazing. It's my pro tip for anyone who teaches. Amanda, Spanish Amanda, who is Spanish Amanda because she is my Spanish professor. Um, she also has lots of good teacher tricks up her sleeve. That's okay. Right. So I think something really important to talk about um, before we even like to kind of back up. So the storytelling process, the story building process can be successful is to be intentional about your planning process. And one of the things that I do when I'm writing my proposal is that I will create, um, it looks exactly like this. This is what I give to my stakeholders. I plot out every major activity that I'm gonna do. And I make sure that there's padding in there so that I have some recovery time before analysis because stuff is flying at you so fast during a study. And especially if you're doing sprints, like it just, it feels like some, like an onslaught of confetti sometimes, you know, it's like you're taking notes, but your brain is not really fully absorbing things. And you have this sense of connections being made, but you, you need that time for your brain to rest so it can start to gel all the pieces together. And so in order to be successful at that, you need to plan to have it so that you can do it. And I think that's something that people don't think about and also for your mental well-being. 
if you're like me, I will go so deep into the rabbit hole that if you let me, I will work 12 hour days, which is not healthy or balanced. And I'll forget to feed myself and all the self care goes out the window because I'm so deep in flow. Um, I'm, if you're in the ADHD club with me, this probably sounds really familiar with having zero concept of time, which can be great if you have time to kill, but when you're on a schedule, you need to time box yourself. And so I will actually also block out my calendar absolutely guilt-free so that I make sure that I have enough time to do the things that I need to do without being under constant stress. And if you work somewhere where they push, remind, I would suggest reminding them that quality might take a little bit more time, but the results will be worth it. And the proof is in the pudding. And I know when I started with my new project team, they were skeptical, like, great, who's this new person? You know, it took a couple studies for them to trust the process and to trust me and my skills. And I got fussed at a little bit about my timelines in the beginning. And I, and I made some compromises but I wasn't willing to compromise to the point where I was going to kill myself and end up sick because I wasn't including that time. And you do really need, in order to be able to build a story, that analysis and synthesis time, you need to be able to play with the data and manipulate it a bunch of different ways and look at it and evaluate it. And that just, it takes time and you've got other stuff you have to do too. It's not, I don't think anybody, well, I don't know anyone who has the luxury of being dedicated to one thing and one thing only with no other responsibilities. And so I just thought I would bring that up. Um, and also being a person who has disabilities, I also think it's important to, and as women who feel like we have to do all the things and then all the other things. I think we take a lot on, um, you know, as women moved away and into the workplace, we didn't free ourselves of domestic duties in a lot of ways. And so there's still a lot of folks out there who don't, you know, don't have um, every hour they're not working, they're working at home in some way. And so for me, for my health, because my disabilities are exacerbated by stress as are most, um, this is something really important to me and that I, that I mentor forward. Does anybody have questions about this before I move on to the next thing? It doesn't look like we have anything in the chat, but if anyone's comfortable coming off mute, um, do that real quick. The random comments. I do love the point of scheduling in self-care and um, like expressing this is what you need to do the job well because people always want you to crunch it in into their timeline. But if they're asking you because they don't know how to do what you do, like you're the expert. So they just need coaching. I know it could be like, what do they mean? I can only do this in two weeks. Like, what are they thinking? They probably aren't think they probably don't know. So, well, some people might push back and, and know what they're doing and try to put you in a box, but other people that do value high quality work, it might just be a coaching moment, right? Um, it may be, a, an opportunity for you to say, well, for you to get the highest quality data or like results, this is what we need to do the right way. And they'll probably appreciate you for being firm on, on that. So what your experience Yeah, I definitely initially got pushback about, well, I don't understand why this takes three weeks. I think it should take two weeks. And I was like, I'm willing to split the difference with you, but I really, if I'm gonna, 
if we're going to meet the objectives that we've agreed upon, I can't, I can't do less than that and deliver the goods that you're asking for. And it's not just me, it's anybody. It just, that's how much time it takes. And um, it, it just took, it took a few times for it to stick. Now I get no pushback on my timelines. He doesn't say like, oh, I think that's unreasonable or I think you should shave off time. I still think he thinks the research takes longer than it should, but he stays quiet about it, which that's fine by me too. Mission accomplished. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Quiet's okay. I'm all right with that. Um, so this is how I usually feel at the end of a study. I'm like, just so, and it doesn't matter if it's card sorting or interviews or workshops or focus groups. It just being on really is a huge mental drain. It's different than, because in some aspects it is a performance. You know, when you are conducting interviews or facilitating, as you know, Kaylin, being a facilitator, it's a different level of attention mm -hmm. than it is when you're just living regular life. You know, you're having to pay attention to everyone in the, the room and kind of constantly taking the temperature and being particularly with interviews and focus groups making sure you're not asking questions in a way that are leading. Even when you have a script, it's easy to stumble. And so if you stumble, how do you recover? And it's just a, the cognitive load is really significant. And I think that, you know, we have to, I was thinking about this recently, that it's really important that we cut ourselves a little bit of slack. And so that comes back to that, just giving ourselves a permission to rest. And when I say that, I mean, for me, most of the time, that just ends up looking like, um, oh shoot, I goofed up. Add, move, no, add new tab, right? It might just be like, it's not like I can go, I don't golf, but if I did, it's not like I hit the golf course for the day. It usually just means that I will block out my calendar for kind of light duty work, you know, get, my, the mindless cleanup after a study, the avalanche of files and notes that have accumulated, um, things that I can do without. And it also gives my brain some time to kind of marinate on those things. I'm trying to du duplicate. That's the one you want, Holly, good job. I'm trying to be able to, I'm so sorry, I don't, my computer is being super laggy, so it's making it extra obnoxiously slow. Er, present, please. Um, you know, I think in some of that quiet time that that's when some of the pieces start to fall together because you just start naturally reflecting on things as you're going through. I hate filing e I hate filing anything, it doesn't matter what it is. So I will put it off until I have to do it. But it's one of those things that I usually save for post-study because it's something that needs to be done. So it's work that needs to be done either way. Um, if this keeps up, Kaylin, I may have you present for me because this is terrible, I'm so sorry. Okay, I'll pull that up, um, make sure I have it. I'm gonna give it one more second because and see if it fixes it, but if not, yeah, I don't think it's gonna, are you gonna do it? Come on. I don't know why it's misbehaving so badly. Do you mind presenting for me? Not at all. I can do that. I don't normally have internet problems, but I guess I do today just because you're doing a presentation, that's all. It, yeah. You're doing a presentation yeah. would be difficult. I think I've kind of come to accept that that's just how that goes. You know? <laughs> like, yeah, expect the unexpected. No mm -hmm. point in flipping out. 
Okay, so and we I were at here. For anybody who is new to research or facilitation, it is 100% guaranteed that something will not go as planned and mm -hmm. it's totally out of your control and it's really okay. Like <laughs> I try to keep in mind that we're not doing organ transplants. Yeah, you know? nobody's dying. It's like a dark joke that our team has. <laughs> like when you start to consider something too much or take it too seriously, like to the point where you're not going home till like eight o'clock, you know, pushing for a software delivery or something. It's like, just wait a second, nobody's dying. We, this push can go out tomorrow. It, it could take a break, you know? Yeah, like, is it, you know, do I really have to sacrifice my physical and mental health to finish this activity today? Probably not. Or like, if something doesn't go exactly as planned, is the world ending? No, it's, mm -hmm. it's okay. And I think keeping your cool is the key to making it look like, it, even if it's a huge deal, making it seem like it's no big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, you're just like, More oh, you. having, having a little technical glitch, hang tight, somebody tell, um, tell a silly joke, which for me is usually like making fun of myself in some way because there's a lot to a lot to go for. I'm a quirky, <laughs> quirky gal. There's no no um, no denying that. Uh, so if you want to advance to the next slide. So I was very proud of the slide <laughs> because I'm a nerd. But and it doesn't look right on your on your display, or maybe it's just be, oh wait, I know why. No, it doesn't, it looks better on mine. I don't know why, uh, I, I'm not as proud of this particular display. Uh, <laughs> definitely resist the urge to Hulk smash. And what I mean is to skip that, giving yourself an afternoon to do filing and clean up, or, you know, if you, work at the kind of place where the culture will allow you to be like, okay, I just knocked out four workshops in four days and I can flex some time and take the afternoon off, like do it. Absolutely do it. Go give yourself some rest. If you Hulk smash your way into it, you're gonna spin your wheels. You're not gonna be productive. You're probably gonna make a lot of mistakes that you're just gonna have to untangle later. And so it's not, um, it is not worthwhile. You are a human and your brain needs to let all that stuff marinate. I always think of it like literally marinating meat, like your brain needs to marinate and all that stuff so that you can come at it with fresh eyes. It's kind of like if you're, um, if you don't have someone to edit a paper if you leave it overnight and come back to it, you see all kinds of stuff you didn't see the day before. Mm -hmm. You know, you just need that, you just need a little bit of a break. So that is my pro tip, no Hulk smashing. It can wait till tomorrow. And besides you plan for it. So it's not gonna be a big deal. Nobody's gonna be complaining that you're not available because you already planned not to be available. Okay, so we already talked about this. Being on is exhausting. Plan for that light work, that cleanup time. And like magic, even though you're not trying to, those pieces are gonna start to kind of slide together. You know, like if you dumped a thousand piece puzzle onto a table um, and imagine them all flipping themselves over the right way and starting to kind of shift towards each other and cluster. I, your brain just kind of does it naturally if you give it that space to do it. And those themes and patterns start to emerge before, if you give it the space to do it. And then, so next slide, please. 
I feel like you're my personal Vanna White, but I feel like, like that is. With much better coding skills. <laughs> I <laughs> hope that I can live up to that. Oh, I know you can. So your storyline really, the first thing you want to do when you're thinking about, okay, I'm, I, you've probably got some ideas as you're going along. Um, and I definitely encourage you to brain dump into things like Excel when you notice things. Um, I use something called a rainbow chart for note taking whenever I can. And I'll try to remember while you guys are doing your activity, I'll look up a, a link and share it with you. But it's a way to organize participant data in a way that's really visual and makes the analysis and synthesis process a little bit easier. And then I've kind of hacked it for my own means. But so you, you the first thing you're going to want to do is what what story do I need to tell? And so sometimes you've gotten so deep into the weeds, you almost kind of forgot why you were there. So going back to that proposal and looking at your business objectives and research objectives is gonna give you direction. It's basically an easy checklist to get started. So in this example, like, oh, I need to validate primary catalog categories for the inbound client experience service catalog. Okay, so that's something I know that I need to collect in my research. Like that's one of some, it's gonna be some part of the story. How it's all gonna to fall together, doesn't matter yet. We can play with these things like they're, you know, um, post-its and move them around. You know, these sort of, you, you start to affinitize as you're going through it. Um, but the first thing that I do is go through and reflect on the business and research objectives and just remind myself that way that I'm not overlooking some little details because I was distracted by whatever I was in the weeds about last. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like we fall prey to the recency effect. If mm -hmm. any of you, I don't know who has a, a psych background, my undergrad degree is in psych, but we tend to remember the most recent event, not the whole thing. And so that's really helpful for me to get the story going. So I'll use this kind of like a checklist and to help me begin organizing things. And then I guess um, I'll pause and ask for questions. Anybody have questions so far? Doesn't look like we have any in the chat, at least, but if anyone, again, if anyone wants to come off mute to you. I'm going to make Spanish Amanda ask a question. <laughs> I'll ask one at some point. <laughs> okay, fair enough. And that's fine. So, <laughs> good software for the rainbow method. Ooh, Maricel's here. She'll help me out. I'm good. You can ask it in Spanish. I'll have her translate in chat if I need it. Thank you, Marisol. <laughs> um, okay, so this sweet pupper's doing his reflection. So you're gonna wanna be collecting your study notes from users, thinking about what are their wants, what are their needs, what were their pain points? And then there's some stuff that you're gonna be like, you know, that's interesting, but if I look at my research and business objectives, it doesn't fit now, but it might later. So I'm not going to toss it, but maybe I'm going to, maybe I'm going to create a new file that's related to it so that I don't lose track of this information. And I have found many times that I'll have concurrent studies that are similar in nature where that becomes very handy. And I recently did a uh, two large card sorting studies back to back and then ended up doing a meta-analysis afterwards. So it totally saved me like a gazillion hours of work to have been kind of collecting those pieces, even though I wasn't using it right now, 
but just to have it organized and available because you don't like maybe I don't need it right now, but I have this hunch that I might in the future, you know, if you're going to those mm -hmm. meetings and you're listening, listening in, um, you start to over time with experience, I think, and, you know, people are dropping clues, even when subconsciously even. Um, and so that, that reflection period when you're going through you're actually going through all your artifacts and a lot of times it's digital files it could be handwritten notes i since i'm hard of hearing i record everything as long as i have i typically work with uh i don't do a lot of client facing work most of mine is internal so getting recordings typically isn't a problem for me i'm able to record most of my sessions so i can you know do transcripts and I don't worry so much about what I'm saying if I don't have as much time as I would like to um I don't have the benefit of a fancy transcript tool which would be amazing because <laughs> they're pretty awesome um I have to do it manually uh but I can skip around to what did the user say here what did they say there and kind of look for some of those things like what was their emotional state what kinds of things did they say and I start making lists and dumping things into spreadsheets and playing with it and I haven't made any decisions yet I'm just kind of seeing what's happening there's a period of experimentation that happens in that reflection and then um, I guess it's like it's sort of going from reflection to action. You're reflecting and looking through those things, but you're also starting to build that story and play with what you have, but you've got those guardrails of the research objectives and the business objectives. So you're not going down every possible rabbit hole. Uh, next. So the other thing I do is mark it up and count it. If it's something that can be counted, anytime you can get some quant in there is always great. The UX space is largely qualitative. There's not a lot of quant in there, but it's not not there. Um, and it may be things like you're going through transcripts and you notice that you have you know, user responses that I will mark, I'll start marking them with keywords. Like I'll start trying to kind of identify those responses and, and tagging them with keywords. And so, and then I'll go back through and sort of standardize it and combine categories. So it's like doing affinity mapping in Excel, basically. That is like my favorite part of the light re UX research we do at our, like we're at a custom software agency. So like we don't get dedicated product research. We get like kind of stints per project, but like the organizing is the most fun part to me. <laughs> I hate marking up transcripts. So the next time I get some, I would be happy to send them. <laughs> okay. I Perfect. will not even gonna lie. If I can get our interns to help, I'm all over it. Now, I still have to go back through it because it's a very, transcript marking is very subjective. You know, what one person thinks something means and what someone else does. And a lot of times I will go play back the recording to see like, you know, what do I think when I read this? What did they say? And then I'll, I'll watch and listen again and I might come up with a completely different answer. like. So it, it is very subjective and very qualitative. Um, so, but I do start looking for what are things that I can count? You know, how many pain points did I encounter in my user interviews? Um, how many pain points were identified in those pain points? How many themes were included in those pain points? And so I think it gives some, even though, you know, we are largely qualitative, I think it gives some 
extra oomph to the research to be able to get some quant in there because it's something that you don't see a lot of. And I think to business stakeholders, it's something that really resonates with them when you're starting to tell the story because they, they tend to be the ones that like the numbers. They're like, yeah, that user feeling stuff, that's nice. But what about the, you're probably gonna have a better chance of persuading them with numbers than you are with feelings. And so I'm always looking for opportunities to, to count things. Even if it's just like literally counting and that's all that I'm reporting out and I'm not doing any like statistical analysis. I just wanna be able to say 20 people said that they hated that or they loved it, whatever it is. Um, okay, no, Vanna. My furry child is talking to me. I think he wants dinner, but I can do the Vanna. Here we are. Okay, thank you. And so while I'm playing with that data, part of what I'm doing is I'm looking for opportunities to compare and contrast things. So I might take a data set and transpose it and look at it the other way. And how do I feel about it that way? Or I'll look at um, the results like in the card sort that I did they had slightly different card sets for reasons that don't matter, um, but they had some that were the same. So I looked, I compared the ones that were the same to see where there was affinity. And then I looked at ones that were similar to see where there was affinity. And then I was also looking for where there was an agreement and like how far apart was that? Was it, you know, Pluto and Venus? Like, are we talking like different solar systems or still in the same neighborhood? Venus and Pluto are in the same solar system. That was a bad analogy, but you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, is it, are we, East Coast, West Coast, or are we same general neighborhood? You know, so I, I'm looking for how far apart those responses are and how alike they are and what the degree of difference is. So that's something that helps start building that story too. And so at this point, I just have kind of random chunks. And I start to think about it like a storyboard. So I've got like this chunk of this and this chunk of that. And it's it's starting to build a story organically. Next, please. So when I'm doing my analysis and th synthesis, and if you can see the picture in the background, I geeked out so hard when I found this picture. I was so excited. <laughs> So excited. It's like some researcher from the 60s and the curtain pattern was unreal. It's like bright it. orange and red. Yeah, it was crazy. But I was like, maybe I'll start if I ever have to go back to an office or even if I don't, I'm getting a lab coat. I just want one. Yeah, I like I'm a it. researcher, right? <laughs> I could have a lab yeah, coat. And then I, the Granimaling my wardrobe and making it so it could be yoga pants and lab coat. Yoga pants, t-shirt, lab coat, done. I never have to think about getting dressed ever again. Uh, so I'm going through, I'm looking for trends. I'm looking for patterns. I'll, I'm looking for those pain points, those emotions. And I'm also looking for things like opportunities for future, future research and exploration. So those little random tidbits that I have kind of a hunch that maybe I'll need later, but I don't need for this, I they may end up in my rec research recommendations. Like I may say something, if we were using that catalog example, I may say, um, I think that we need to further study 
XYZ categories because there wasn't enough consensus among the groups. You know, they were in different states, not different neighborhoods. Like we just weren't, the mental models were so far apart that we didn't get where we need to be to have data that's directional. And even though there's gonna be a little bit of groaning because they want the answer now, 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 it will pay dividends because if it's not done well now, they're gonna, it's gonna get redone later, inevitably, or you're gonna have a lot of unhappy folks who are complaining all the time. So either outcome is not great. I can usually persuade them that it is worth their time to make that investment. And a lot of times that second look at the same topic can be a more compressed study. So it's not as hard of a step, a sell. And then next. So when I'm looking for the pain points, I was also very proud of the slide. I get proud of my slides and my memes, like guys get about their dad jokes. Like I <laughs> thought it was so hilarious last night when I put this together. It made me smile. I, I love it. And I was like, should I compare users to animals? And I was like, I don't know. I would use any of these pictures for myself. So it's fine. Um, that was the decision that I came to. I was like, and they're adorable. Even the mad one's adorable. So I don't know what he is, but he's very angry. Uh, someday I'm gonna make a t-shirt or a button that says too many clicks because I think that is the number one. If it's, it's tough to say, this is my freebie if you're new to research, you can just put too many clicks in the research results as a finding and you'll be right every single time or too much scrolling, either one, depending on what your product is and it's, 99.9% .9 of the time going to be correct. <laughs> um, so that's, that is one that I always look for when I'm going through marked up transcripts is how many times people complained about clicks and scrolling because there's a, a like, so such a common complaint. People do not like to have to navigate or click needlessly. Um, and I also love it when I get like these happy guys who are so thrilled. They're like, oh my God, this is gonna make my life so much easier. It's been rough over here. Like that's very satisfying. And that's also when you're talking about um, software that is, you know, something's being sunset, which is our very office-y way of saying we're killing it and gonna replace it. <laughs> We're gonna sunset it. I've had to explain that to a few users before. They're like, what does sunset mean? I'm like, it means it's going away. It's like, we're afraid to say we're gonna kill it. It's like, oh, it passed away. <laughs> it's like super, <laughs> super back. polite. The first time I heard someone say they were sunsetting software, I was so confused. But so if they're gonna replace software and that's the user's response to the prototype, that is the best, right? Like, so I wanna make sure if I've got users in there who are saying things like that, that I wanna really capture that feeling and that emotion. And um, depending on the kind of software that you have, you could be including video clips and also privacy permissions and those sorts of things. You have to be sensitive about that. If you're doing client facing work, it's, client or internal, you know, you just got to check with your folks and find out where your guardrails are so that you make sure that you are um, not accidentally getting yourself in trouble trying to do a good job by including videos that were not intended to be shared, things like that. That's my cautionary tale, not an experience that happened to me, but um, it's happened to other people I know and it's it's a bummer to get in trouble when you were just trying to do a good job because you didn't know about some rule. So just a good idea to find out what's what's okay to wear and what's okay to share and what it's not okay to share or if you need to have limited distribution for something like that. But so what your users say, I mean, that is literally the focus of the research is getting that feedback. So anyway, now a page full of verbatims 
as they like to call them in my world, or as the whole rest of the world calls them, quotes. Um, we, and when we have our lab coats on, we say verbatims. And then the, all the other days, we just say quotes. Uh, you know, a page full of verbatims doesn't have much punch, but if you can pepper your presentation as you're talking about different data points, and that maybe it's not something that you're gonna have that page of quotes, but it's in your notes for your presentation that when you get to a data set, you're like, and the user said, oh my God, this is gonna make my life so much easier. Or you get to a different data set and boy, we had a lot of folks who were really had a lot of anxiety about how much clicking around they were gonna have to do. And in fact, one user said, blah, blah, blah. And it's not in text on the screen. You wanna always keep that to a minimum. Um, I went to a great talk not that long ago and uh, one of the best things that she said is that people are lazy readers. They don't wanna read a lot of stuff on the screen. And it's true. I mean, I'm a lazy reader and I like to read. I, it just, that's, I think, I don't know, maybe it's like Zoom fatigue, you know, PowerPoint, Google slide fatigue. Okay, next. Okay, how are we gonna mic drop with data biz? So Kaylin, I wanna find out, so I wanna do an activity that's gonna take 20 minutes. What time okay. should I plan? And then, well, I guess in total, it'll be like maybe 30 minutes because I want them to have 15 or 20 minutes to do the activity and then like 10 minutes for a quick report out. What time should I stop? Should I stop at the um, top of that hour? So I'm gonna or, pause the share again because I need to pull up our agenda one more time. So we had planned to start the breakout rooms at 620, but we were having a good discussion. So um, all we have planned after that is just the Q&A and discussion. So I think as long as we come back, by like seven, um, oh five, <laughs> we can still have some time to chat. Uh, technically, the event does go to, through to seven thirty, so our closing can be like toward the end of that. Okay, so I'm central and it's eight thirty eight right now. Mm -hmm. How much more time do I have to talk before I send people to breakout rooms? Not much like 10 minutes? Five to 10. Okay, this will be really fast. <laughs> okay, mic drop with data viz. So we can go to the next one. Okay. So we got the beginning of the story with our objectives, right? And we started exploring the fruits of our research late labor and data viz is where we can really flex that storytelling muscle because people love pictures doesn't even matter what the pictures are half the time but they love them um and it also is less cognitive load to look at a visual done right there there are lots of bad there's a lot of da bad data viz out there but done well it helps people consume information so much faster. Um, and it can do a lot better job than bullet points. So tables are a great way to compare values, you know, and show something really simple. You can use things like conditional formatting if you wanna give them some flair, um, but they're not good at doing things like showing a trend or a pattern. You know, people would have to identify that themselves by looking at it, where, you know, I purposely put these numbers in ascending order, but chances are they would be mixed up. And then the person looking at the table would have to try and figure that out. So they're not good for trends or patterns, but they are good for some things. So 
uh, next charts. Sorry. Charts are really <laughs> great. That. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Um, they're really good at showing like the shape of the data and showing trends and patterns. And you don't have the keep it simple, stupid, which is okay. That's not a very nice saying. We'll just call it kiss. Keep it simple, silly. Okay. I like that one better. Keep it simple, silly. You do not have to make these like elaborate charts to get your point across or to have something that really packs some punch because what's going to pack the punch is the data, not the design. There are some kind of basic design rules that I'm going to tell you about real quick before I send you into your activity that will help guide you so that you keep a really, you know, this is just a simple bar chart, but it looks nice, right? Like it, it does exactly what it needs to do. Um, and it's visually appealing. And a lot of times I will put together a page that mimics a, ba a dashboard in Excel, um, just doing a bunch of different by our bar charts and donut charts or gauge charts. And I'll do it in Excel and make it look like a dashboard. And so it gives a good summary of the data at a glance. Oh, hi, Kit Kit. Okay, next one. He wanted to hear the talk. <laughs> Obviously. So just say no to pie charts. Dear God, to, like our brains don't do a very good job of understanding wedges of pie. If you've ever cut a pizza, you can relate to this idea. Like we think we cut it down the middle, but then when you go the other direction, somehow it's not right anymore. Um, write justify numbers and go easy on the decimals. Do you really need 18 decimal points or numbers after the decimal? Probably not. Tighten it up. Two is probably the most you're going to need most of the time. And it's the rule is left justify in almost all cases for accessibility reasons. But for numbers, because of the decimal point, it's always going to be to the right. Time should be on a horizontal axis. And for bar and column charts, you want to do ascending and descending by value versus alphabetical, which is not, I do break that rule occasionally because like if it's days of the week, I, I just can't, it just sound, it, my brain does not like it. It just looks weird to me. Um, and if you only have one or two values, what I did in these boxes here, when I do those Excel dashboards, I will just put in big colored blocks with numbers in them. You don't need a chart. And that has that same punch when you're combining it with other, you know, I'm using those design elements and you guys are coders, so you can probably code this out. But, um, you know, I've got this rectangular shape and things that are similarly shaped within a frame. So I've got good balance, I've got good white space and it tells them exactly what they need to know and I've got all the contrast I need. Next. And then so color, when it comes to charts and it doesn't matter what kind of chart it is, keep in mind that it's not decorative, that it has a purpose and its purpose is to communicate. So if it's the same value so for the one on the left, they're all months. So it's really the same value. You want to use the same color, different hues. Now for the other one, I've got dog breeds. So you could make an argument that they're all dog breeds, but I find them all to be very distinct, different values. I counted how many of each my friends have um, off the top of my head. So I wanted to highlight their individualness. So I made them different colors. And with bar charts, you wanna try not to get past like five or six. Once you get more than five or six bars in a bar chart, it starts getting 
it's kind of stops losing meeting and looking not useful. You'd be better to break it up into smaller, take something large and make it into four small ones. Okay, next. Be ethical. So if you look at these two charts, it is exactly the same information. And the difference is the one on the right seems so much more dramatic because the scale begins at 15. And this is something that you will see tricky, bad journalism will do what you see on the right with the little Z squiggle that's telling you that the chart's compressed. And it makes it seem like, oh my gosh, there's such a huge difference between Monday and Friday. Well, when you show the full scale, not really. There's not hardly any difference at all, but they've just chopped the top off. And so make sure that you're not doing that. Same thing with lines. You don't want to stretch them in any way because it can be, that distortion can be misleading. Next, please. And then clarity, you want to use text labels. So I hate pie charts, but I love a nice donut chart done well. Um, if you don't need a legend, don't clutter. And then data to ink ratio is exactly that clutter. Get rid of all the extraneous stuff that you can. White space is your friend. That gives people's brain space to stay focused on what it is that you're telling them that's important. And I'm not a big fan of, you know, many layered line charts and that sort of thing. It just, it starts to lose meaning and get overwhelming. But something really simple like this can be very effective because there isn't any unnecessary clutter. It tells you everything you need to know and it's easy to look at. And so that's all data to ink just means get rid of all the extra junk. Next. I'm trying really hard to go fast. So accessibility, you want to check color contrast. There's plenty of color contrast checking tools. You want to use alt text. If you right click on your image, you can add your alt text. I gave you an example of how I did it for the donut chart. You also want to add anything in a presentation, whether it's PowerPoint or Google Slides, essentially you have to retype everything that's on the screen into the speaker notes for it to be truly accessible for a screen reader. You want to use large, easy to read fonts. I try, ne try really hard to never go below 16. Um, and then whenever possible, enable live transcripts and and closed captions. And you can actually do that in presentation mode with Google Slides as well. So if you don't have that for whatever you're presenting with, you can also, if you use Google Slides, you can use their um, auto-generated ones. Next. So here's a big uh, infographic that gives you an idea of like kind of what direction you might go. Uh, there's some charts on here I'm not a huge fan of. Don't really like scatter plots and bubble plots because brains aren't good at deciphering the differences between sizes. You know, like if you look at that bubble says, it's a little, it's meant to show relationship, but we're not very good good at that. Um, usually if you're in Excel and things like that, it will recommend charts. And a lot of times it is really the best recommendation. Um, and you can just play around with them, but this is a good reference. Yeah, me either, Claire. I've never figured them out. Tree maps are a mystery to everyone and they don't even look like a tree. This also is a good point to bring up. Will you be sharing the slides or should we send those out in the recap? Yeah, for sure. OK, great. That was one of the questions that just kind of came through. So we'll make sure we send these out. Yep. I think we just have one or two more, and then we can send them off. OK, next thing. Yep. Oh, activity time. 
Perfect. <laughs> okay. So I was like, I know we're really close. So what I would love for you guys to do, so get excited. Activity time, yay. Um, I will have someone on the team randomly break out folks into even like distributed groups. Okay, perfect. And then can you advance to the next slide? Yes. So I am giving you a data set. We're going to pretend that you had five participants that were shown a prototype for some new internal customer service software. And at the end of your interviews, you asked them, you gave them a Likert scale, which I really want to have a different name. Um, <laughs> one to five. I call it Likert. I know it's wrong, but I do it anyway. Just, I just, it just feels bad. Uh, it feels icky at work. Uh, so low to high, people were asked to rate how they felt about the design, the usability, and learnability. So there are lots of different things you could do here. So you could, for instance, mm, I'm going to let you guys come up with some ideas because you've got that. Um, can we share the deck with them in the room so they can see the chart example? You've got lots of different ways that you can, you could bust this up into lots of different charts, or you could try and make it just a couple um, or a few. But what would be, I, I want to see what you all think would be the best way to tell the story. And so also keep in mind, you think have things like mean and median in your pocket. So mean is your average and median is your true middle score. I know you all know how to Google and there's calculators for it. And it's a really small data set. So we're going to give you however much time Kaylin says to see what yeah. you can come up with. And so, I'm super excited. I can't wait. I have changed it to be two rooms and we'll have, um, let's see what I do. There's always a journey to do the breakout room. So it's going to automatically send the attendees into rooms one and two. Me, Amanda, Holly, and Susie will be just kind of floating. Um, we might jump in if we need to, but we might just kind of do some prep work while you do your activity. Um, and then let's see. They'll close after, let's do, let's try 20 minutes. And then it'll count down two minutes to your time limit. So you'll know when you need to start hurrying up. And then we can come back to the main room and do some Q and A and some chatting. All right. So I think when I click yeah, the button, everyone's perfect. gonna distribute. But are we ready? Magic carpet. I think so, yes. Oh yeah, that's what you you were the one, do you remember that that showed me how to do this, like several design study nights ago? Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, and if you want to take a screenshot, now's your chance. Yes, Claire. Um, did share one. So that is there if you all want to download that. And I, I think the chat resets when you go to breakout rooms, I'm not sure. It does. Yeah. Okay. So you might want to grab a screenshot. I'll leave it up for her. And Holly, you. just to clarify, are you wanting us to represent this like in the best way visually or what, what exactly is whatever, that? <laughs> whatever story you this tells you, I, I just want you to tell a story. So you can, this data could be sliced and diced lots of different ways. Um, fantastic. So who's next? Because um, we have two groups, right? Yeah, hey, this is Claire. Um, I um, will, I guess I'll share my screen. Oh God, I hope I don't have anything bonkers open. <laughs> um just kidding just a million tabs don't, don't. <laughs> no um, one's judging here <laughs> no one's judging. um so i was nominated by someone else in the group to chat about this so we kind of broke it down into averages and we just talked about this a little bit but we did um average scores for design usability learnability 
and then one for the like overall system score. So like we took these composite, these averages at the bottom and kind of made them a composite and took the average of that to figure out like, okay, how well did the system overall out of five kind of fare? Um, and that's the score at the top. And then design, this is on Miro, sorry, I should have like with that, um, which I am new to using, but I like how pretty it is. So that was why we did that. Um, design got a 4.2, usability got a 3.6, and learnability got a 3.8. But as Holly mentioned, that kind of flattens out those outliers and doesn't include that data. So if I were doing this, I would just include a, a, an executive summary that would have something about that in there. But I, I, I like Holly's point about using the median for that um, purpose. Um, and then someone in our group, I still don't know who it was, made this really cool chart um, that's like a little more conventional, but also really easy to look at um, that just takes the mode of each of the ones. So like how many four ratings did, did each category get? How many five ratings and how many threes? And so this does capture a little bit of like, okay, how many people were on the low or the high end of the spectrum? And so I liked that they had kind of done that because you could get a sense of like, well, somebody had a, had a problem with one of the areas and then you can go back in the data. We could tell you which one it is. And then somebody really enjoyed this other category and kind of tells you who, what that is. So this is a little bit more of like capturing some of that, um, the outlier data. And then the one up here, which looks really huge now, um, <laughs> was kind of like, just like giving you a sense of like, okay, here's how each of them sort of did. I don't know. This is the best we could do in 20 minutes. <laughs> I think it's fantastic. I love that you used color and that, um, so when I do my executive summary, that's usually where I have my dashboard. Um, mm -hmm. And I feel like it's a bit of a spoiler in a presentation. So I usually skip the executive summary in a presentation, but it's included when I distribute my report. I'm like, if I do the executive summary, then nobody's going to stick around for the rest of it because <laughs> they're going to be like, I got all the highlights. Um, then for, so I think that that's great, you know, having that kind of dashboard look and you can, you know, obviously a study is going to have a lot more categories than just those, you're going to have a lot more to say than just those few things. But just from looking at this, I can see that our greatest opportunity for improvement is usability. So then that would make me think, okay, I'm going to go back and look through my notes and my transcripts and what is it about the usability exactly? What story are they telling us there? You know, what themes are emerging? And there's almost always a pattern. You know, people's mental models for how things work. If you think about um, Jacob's Law, that people spend more time on other people's sites than yours, that you know you're probably breaking some convention that people are accustomed to. You know, it's probably not anything um, earth shattering that needs to be changed. It's a lot of times kind of not a big tweak. And then for the one at the bottom, I think that one's fantastic too. I think the only thing that I might do differently is since even though they are the same topics, I would probably have break the rule and make the bars different colors or make it gradient or mm -hmm. different hues of the same color. And I would eliminate the half, half scores since we didn't have anyone who had those scores and just show the whole numbers mm -hmm. because that goes back to that kind of like getting rid of anything that might be visual clutter um just so that there's not uh, you know any additional distraction just like with visual design data biz and in your storytelling you know, white space is definitely your friend. Mm -hmm. And the more of it you can get in there, the more that people are gonna focus on. And the other thing that's good about this is that you're showing the whole scale. So I think probably why this person went to 3.5 is to exceed the three, but I would go to the next whole number just so that you can, I would go all the way to five. Mm -hmm. or no, I would go to four, I would go to the next whole number um, 
so that you can see uh, the the full scale that oh. you know three was the the mode the highest mode was three and if good, you don't know what tips, mode Holly. Is, <laughs> what's that? Good, good tips holly i made that chart and i did not know how to modify it very much i actually didn't even notice the point in <laughs> the decimals till you mention it but yeah oh yeah, yeah it's usually like a I would rate Miro's usability on their charts like a three or a two. <laughs> Miro is not um, a very accessible tool. So I tend to stray towards Mural because you can mm -hmm. at least keyboard navigate with it. With Miro, you can't. If mm -hmm. you aren't somebody who has accessibility needs, it's great. It's fine. But um, when I'm when I'm thinking about doing presentations or things that are interactive, I make sure that any tool that I'm gonna be sharing or asking people to use is gonna be keyboard only friendly and um, Miro is definitely not. Mural is technically, but not great. It's it's better, but it's, it's not perfect. It's not really, it's so mouse, mousy by design, the keyboard navigation is kind of neat. Did you, Kaylin, can we show them the rainbow chart real quick? Yes, and while I pull that up, we had one question. I think that's the only one that was lingering in the chat. I wanna make sure we catch it. Um, how long would you say you go over the same interview in total for the video and going over the transcript? That depends on how long the interview or the focus group is. So I would say that for every, if I have to manually code a transcript or mark it up, it's usually going to take me, end up taking me double the time mm -hmm. of the interview. If I have to manually transcribe it, then mark it up. It can be a pretty tedious, laborious process if you don't have a good tool for it. Um, so you you definitely you know and if you're new i would give yourself two hours for every hour you know you get faster with practice but it is a tedious process I and i know some tools for it like auto transcribing um i think there's otter zoom apparently does the cloud recording and auto transcript and then i've used dovetail which you do still have to go through so it still, still does take time, just not as much as if you're doing it manually, annually? Yeah, and it just depends on the industry you work in. I work in FinTech, so I can use none of those things. Dovetail has like, you can enter like jargon, like industry terms. So like before it transcribes, you can say like, these are specific um, like acronyms or whatever, like industry jargon before oh no i mean just there. security wise I'm, like, oh yeah, like i understand stuff. yeah FinTech yeah i just or, like fintech is very locked down like the flash drive on my computer is disabled i can't email any attachments out i am my hands are completely tied the only way that i could get work out of my computer is to take a picture of it with my <laughs> phone Amanda, I can't even handling. print a document. <laughs> I can't print an interview for an interview. Everything's on screen. It's like all trapped inside my computer, <laughs> which makes the portfolio process interesting. Um, so, but rainbow charts, I like, that's a really easy way to synthesize notes and see patterns. And I did include a link there. I've got just a touch of clean up to do on my deck before we send it out. Um, but uh, yeah, you guys were fantastic. Does anyone else have other questions? I tried to cite all my sources and give thanks to the people who give great stock photography for $0. Does anyone have any questions for me? Ah, uh, you too, Claire. Your hair's so cute. I don't feel like I haven't seen you in a hundred years. It's been more like a thousand, actually. So. I know. The last time I saw you, you had shoulder-length hair, and I was taking your portrait at the park. 
I shaved that puppy off. All gone. I would. Hey, if this thing wasn't a dented tin can, I'd be right there with you. Oh, and let me drop. I'll drop in the chat. Um, I'm always happy to offer mentorship, answer questions, you know, whatever. I'm pretty active on Twitter. Um, I suck at checking email, not even gonna lie. Oh, we're forgetting something. Oh, yeah, we have the books. <laughs> Is that enough tension build up? Yeah, it was so, so good, I forgot. Um, so you can contact me on Twitter and my LinkedIn is the same. So it's the linkedin.com forward slash in forward slash 314 that should work. You definitely can email me. Um, just know that I get an absurd amount of email. And if I don't reply, right away it's not lack of love it's just me being shitty at email why can't i remember my email address i had a really high stress day you guys it's that i'm normally not quite this spacey i um i'll i'll tell you my secret i went to the neurosurgeon this morning and i'm having brain surgery so I started my day talking about drilling a hole in my skull. So I'm not doing my best tracking right now. And um, remembering my email address should be easy, but it, today it feels hard. <laughs> and I'll be fine. That's totally fine with the drilling in your head. I'll be fine. <laughs> I'll be fine. It hasn't quite sunk in yet, but it's all good. It's all it's all for the good. But when you are thinking about accessibility, you like, remember, it's people like me, literally. I, my tremors have accelerated and advanced to the point that I need to have brain surgery. And sometimes I'm a keyboard only user. Um, and I'm also hard of hearing. And so we're not disabled people are not somebody out there we're right here and i'm one of those people so it's not please don't think of it as an add-on um and if you read the chapter in my book i have a pretty strong call to action that accessibility is everyone's responsibility so I like it. That's a good note to end on. Well, almost end on before we get to the giveaway. I looked up a random number generator and then used that to pick from the eight responses we got. So I have the names of in the from the order that you picked or entered the form. Then I have your the random number generator in order. So Marisol was the first winner. And then we had Pamela, yeah. Jessica. Claire and Kayla. Yay! <laughs> so then I'll pass your email addresses to Holly. Um, and then I figure you can reach out over email. Yep. So what I'll do is I'll send your email to the publisher. So it should come directly from O'Reilly Media or, or uh, O'Reilly Publishing or Rosenfeld Media directly from them. Yes. Chapter twenty one. <laughs> I've done the last ones. All right. Uh, I, thanks, Claire. Thank you favorite. all so much for coming tonight. It was and thanks to my St. Louis peeps. Yeah. It's always hard to get people um, with the the classic mm -hmm. Zoom fatigue. Thank you, Cervantes. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Is there anything else before we wrap up? Yeah, and please feel free to reach out. Surprisingly, brain surgery is like, I'll be down for three days, then I'm back at it. I know, it's crazy. She'll be back on social. <laughs> Send her lots of cute animal pics and baby yeah. pics. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. and Claire, I have been requesting my locals take me for walks like a dog. 
So I'll take you for walks. I'll get a little wagon and I'll put you in there. There you go. Well, I'm trying to improve my mobility. <laughs> yeah, so. that's fair. That's fair. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So it's getting awesome. late for you, especially everybody in St. Louis. Um, and it's, I'm already tired because I'm cutting off of caffeine. So Oof. if I was yawning, it's not because this wasn't <laughs> fun, just losing the coffee. So I'm going to wrap up. Thank you so much uh, forever to Holly and for Amanda and Susie for co-hosting with Women Who Code Portland for 52. Um, sent out a bunch of LinkedIn invites. Super happy to connect there. Um, thanks as always for coming and we'll send out a recap um, when the recording's out. So we'll have the recording link and then Holly has some time to clean up her presentation slides and then um, book giveaway winners, congrats and uh, O'Reilly will be in touch. Thank you very much. We yes, really enjoyed thank, it. Thank you guys thank for you hosting. So thank you. It was so nice to meet all of you and see all of you and Kaylin, you know, I Mwah. adore you. Kisses. <laughs> Illy. Okay. Good night. Spanish, Good night, Amanda. Everybody. Thank you.